You've heard us use a lot of 3D printing lingo on this channel. You may not know what some of it means. We hope to answer those questions for you, but to do that, we have to go back to basics. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, Victoria is off doing important cat things, so her stunt double is standing in once again. But this kind of stuff bores her anyway. She doesn't like to talk. She likes to get pet. We're going to talk all about the lingo of the 3D printing world because yeah, a lot of it kind of doesn't make a ton of sense. A lot of it does, though, and really the first one is parametric. We say it all the time. Parametric means that the model is defined by parameters. Lengths, diameters, materials, parametric. If you are building in CAD, like Fusion 360, Onshape, SolidWorks, and the like, you are building in parametric. If you are building inside of ZBrush, that is not parametric. It is sculpting. Anyways, one of the big ones that is uh, a fun little tidbit, which we actually mentioned in a previous video, is brim versus skirt. Brim, like on a hat, is attached to your head, and a skirt flows around you. So that's what it means in 3D printing as well. A brim is attached to your part. If your part has a tendency to warp, you might add a brim to it to make it stick really well. And as we say in the industry, if you like it, then you should put a brim on it because you don't want it falling over and turning into a plate of mom spaghetti. We're gonna talk to you all about 3D printing failures in an upcoming video, so don't forget to get subscribed and hey, leave us a like. Then we move into rafts. Rafts are a little bit antiquated. They were utilized back in the day when we didn't have heated beds and it's basically really fat, thick layers to make sure that your part sticks to the bed because the raft will grab onto basically anything. Then you print on top of the raft and you rip the raft off. It results in not the greatest surface finish. But now that we have printers with heated beds and even some with heated enclosures, we don't really need rafts anymore. To me, it's completely antiquated, not used whatsoever. What is still used is support material. And there are two types of support. You have your regular support and your dense support. Support material is, well, supporting. And no, this is not an athletic supporter. This is a 3D printing supporter. This is all about making sure that when you are printing in your hot plastic, that when you are trying to go over something, that you have something there to keep it from drooping. Support, supports your models and makes parts better. Now, normally you will have some dense support. That way you can run like 5% for regular support and then 80% for your dense support. And then that way your part can lay on it without wasting tons of material. And there's infill. We've talked about infill a little bit, but there are so many different types of infill, including, but not limited to, of course, the Hilbert curve, the Archimedes circle, the octagonal, the concentricity, the honeycomb, the 3D honeycomb, rectilinear grid and line, as well as gyroid, my favorite, uh, and so many others, with cubic being really the best all-around performer that doesn't make for a lot of time. Gyroid is technically the best performer, and by the way, if you don't know what gyroid infill looks like, right here will be one of our time lapses running real quick so you can see the gyroid infill. We always use gyroid for the time lapse because it just looks the best. But there are also percentages when you're dealing with infill. Everything from, well, zero up to 100%, which is basically dead solid, but 100% infill is not as strong as 100% perimeters. Perimeters are always stronger than infill. And perimeters are really all about how many outlines of your part before you start doing your pattern for your infill. The more perimeters you have, the stronger your part will be. So if you are going for something that is more for go and not much for show, perimeters, perimeters, perimeters. We actually did a beautiful part that is designed to withstand uh, depths of 150 meters underwater and it was pure perimeters because we one needed to make sure there was no air pockets because they would cavitate but two it's got to go really friggin deep so we wanted to make it right but to 3d print you need meshes that are both manifold and watertight manifold being that it is geometrically sound with no self intersecting faces naked edges or holes in its mesh this is not a nude beach make sure your edges are covered up and manifold is important because otherwise you end up with 
holes, and holes are where the water type problem comes in. Water type means a solid model where there are no gaps in the surface. If the part was real and filled with water, nothing would leak out. Additive manufacturing pre-processing software requires watertight solids in order to create an accurate boundary for each layer and to know which side of a surface is inside and which of the part is outside. This is really important. If you are not designing properly inside of your CAD softwares, or maybe your designer didn't do a good job, your model may not be manifold or watertight. That's a problem. And there are ways to fix it. Prusa Slicer has a built-in fixing system that utilizes NetFab to fix it for you, which is awesome, but it's not always perfect. So start with good models. You won't have any problems. Retraction. The bane of a lot of 3D printers' existence. Retraction is eh, a bit of a dark art, really, but retraction is when the extruder reverses direction, pulling the filament out of the hot end so that when it goes to make a move, it can move without oozing everywhere and making a mess. By the way, if you don't remember, we're going to do a whole video on those failures, so get subscribed. This one is picky, especially for Bowden style hot ends. They need lots of retraction where your direct drive, where the extruder is basically right on top of the hot end, need a lot less because of ooze fat. We then go into line width. Line width is an interesting one. Most people think that I have a 0.4 millimeter diameter nozzle, so I want my line width to be 0.4 millimeters. And no, you don't. You actually want it to be a little bit wider, upwards of 20% wider. We recommend for a 0.4 nozzle, anywhere between 0.42 and 0.5 for your line width, and that will vary depending on your part. You can go less than 0.4, but realize you will sacrifice lots of strength to deal with those thinner lines. Extrusion multiplier. This one is argued heavily throughout the industry. Should you mess with your extrusion multiplier? We at 3D Musketeers say no, you should work on your steps per millimeter. We will get into that. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this one because this is more 30,000 foot level. Tuning an extrusion multiplier and tuning your steps per millimeter does take some time. I'll have a link to a great article in the description all about this. That way you guys can look at it for yourselves before we film the video. Bridging. Bridging is what you do when you want to take a risk and really don't care. Bridging is awesome. It enables you to basically print completely across a surface without any support material. Bridging over troubled water? No, don't bridge over troubled water, but bridging over troubled water is useful. Not in 3D printing though, you have to have good cooling. Bridging requires good cooling and adequate cooling, but not too much, because it might bend upwards instead of actually going flat. And there is a whole, again, a dark art into bridging itself, but it involves cooling. And bridging is great because you can reduce your amount of support material necessary. This one you kind of get over time and each printer is a little bit different in that regard. But cooling is when you have a fan and most printers should hopefully come with a part cooling fan that cools the part that's being printed. Remember, this hot end gets upwards of 250 degrees centigrade and that hot plastic is, well, hot. And you got to use a fan to cool it down. Too much cooling and your part can warp. Not enough cooling and it won't cure fast enough to basically be ready for that next layer and it ends up being droopy and runny and it just it doesn't look great. Temperatures, we talked about that in our materials video so if you want to learn about temperatures click the card right here at the top of the screen and orientation is a bit of a crazy one because it really does depend. If you saw on one of our live streams when we were making a part for my dad orientation mattered so much because if we printed the part vertically and it was like this if you printed it vertically these top bits would be able to flex and break but if we printed it facing down just like this the strength of the perimeters is consistent across the entire part keeping it from being brittle remember 3d printing especially fdm 3d printing is weakest on the z axis so if you can orient your parts to have one the least amount of z but two to make sure that the z-axis is in a direction that really isn't going to hurt strength, then you can build incredibly strong 3D prints. If you guys want to see a video all about testing orientation and the strength of parts, let me know, and we can have that coming for you shortly here on the 3D Musketeers YouTube channel. Bed leveling. Bed leveling is... Uh, 
I don't like doing it. That's why we buy 3D printers like Prusa Mark 3S's and Prusa Minis that have bed leveling built in. It's kind of the bane of our existence. We started off with 3D printers that did manual bed leveling and you're basically turning screws and using a piece of paper and you feel right when the nozzle hits that piece of paper where it grabs it just a hair then you move it to the next point and the next point and the next point and then you got to do it one more time because you might have knocked that first point out of alignment it's a pain in the butt it's gotten better to a point where you don't have to do it as often as we used to but i still prefer auto bed leveling because well it takes all the guesswork out of it for you. Curing is more specific for the resin printing, but we did think it was valuable to have inside of the 3D printed lingo video. But curing is when you take your raw resin prints and put them in UV light to cure any uncured resin on the part. This is done normally after you wash it and then after you remove the support material. And this makes sure that your model is nice and solid, but don't leave it in the curing too long because you can over cure parts and it is very obvious especially on clear parts that well they'll turn yellow and if you're wondering all about resin and some of the materials about it there'll be a card right here where you can go check out that video then we move back into the fdm style which is the extruders and hot ends extruder is the motor generally with gears that pushes the filament down through the filament path into the hot end and eventually out onto your additive manufacturing etch-a-sketch hot glue gun machine that we like to call a 3d printer the hot end is the part that well gets hot. We don't want these to be ice cold, we want them to be nice and toasty so that you can extrude the filament at its right temperatures, generally somewhere over 180 degrees centigrade and for some crazy materials way above 300. By the way, want to learn about FDM materials? There'll be another card right there to the FDM materials. And the nozzles are important. Nozzles kind of let you know what you can and can't print with. This is a tungsten carbide nozzle. And that means that we can print basically everything because tungsten carbide is the paragon of metals. Normal 3D printers come with brass nozzles and those nozzles are great for your everyday materials like PLA, PETG, ABS, ASA, all the general materials that we mentioned in the beginning of our materials FDM video, but it cannot do any of the filled materials like carbon fiber, glow in the dark, wood fill that have a tendency to wear out the nozzles because those materials are harder than brass. Yes, even wood fill is harder than brass. Brass nozzles are consumable. Nozzles in general are considered consumable in the 3D printing industry. Keep spares, they're not expensive. Just like silicone socks or your hot ends, keep spares, they're not expensive, and they keep you from having blob of doom. And yes, I know I said it once before, but I'll say it again. We've got a video coming at you real soon about 3D printing failures where maybe if you're maybe if you guys ask nicely in the comments below, I will force printers to fail in different methods so you can see what it looks like. But you gotta ask nicely in the comments. Filament. Filament is everything to FFF or FDM. It's literally in the name. Fused filament fabrication. It's great. It is your raw material that you use to make your parts and can come in a wide variety of material choices with the most popular being PLA and PETG. Those are great starter materials that are, well, very forgiving overall as a material. We have all of our post-processing as well, which involves things like support removal, sanding, painting, priming, and all the stuff you might do after the print is done. We have a build plate for a 3D printer as well. The build plate is where your part is built on, and a lot of times these are flexible. Recently, this has become a big thing to have flexible steel sheets on the build plates because it makes it so easy to remove the parts and you're less likely to stab yourself in the hand, which, you know, our general preference is not to stab ourselves, at least for me. And I'm not here to shame what you guys do in your free time. Rep wrap was what we all used to call 3D printers. It stands for replicating rapid prototyping because the idea was that you could use a 3D printer to make 3D printers. And yes, that's totally possible. If you look at the machines behind me, all the orange and colored parts that you see that aren't black are actually 3D printed, which is amazing that you can use a 3D printer to not just make more 3D printers, but upgrade your 3D printer. Self-replicating. Eh? Eh? 
You buy one, you make your own, and then you return it. Don't do that. Don't be that person, but that's the joke, right? We have our axes, X, Y, and Z. X goes across, Y comes in and out, Z goes up and down. Done and done. Firmware is the software that runs on your machine. It should be periodically updated depending on your manufacturer. They might release updates often like Prusa does, or they may not. Check your manufacturer's website for more information there. If you are not aware of how to flash your firmware, just leave it the way it is if it's fine. Understand that new firmwares can unlock some certain features that may not have been available earlier on, but if your printer is working and you need it for a very mission critical thing, don't upgrade the firmware. Do it when you have time to mess around with things. And of course, we would be remiss if we did not mention the slicer, the brain of the 3D printer, although I guess that would be the motherboard, but the slicer is where you, the human, interacts with what would eventually be the print, where you can set all of your settings for perimeters, infill support, dense support, extrusion width, extrusion multiplier, rafts, brims, skirts, and basically everything that we talked about in this video. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I hope you learned something. Let us know in the comments what you learned and what you found most valuable and maybe we missed something because that happens from time to time. But hey, get subscribed, leave us a like on this video, and hey, we're going to be doing a video all about CAD terms soon, so don't worry if you're wondering, I don't understand that cat. No, CAD, nobody understands Victoria, it's fine. We're gonna help you understand all the things that are difficult about this industry right here on the 3D Musketeers YouTube channel. Stay safe out there, don't forget to call your loved ones, and as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one. You don't want it falling over and turning into a plate of mom's spaghetti. And if you're wondering, what? Mom's spaghetti? Is he nervous, but on the surface, he looks calm and ready to drop bombs of 3D printing knowledge right here on the 3D Musketeers YouTube channel. By the way, if you didn't get